Welcome back everyone. So, it's been a really long year. It's now 2024 and it's been an awful long time since I've spoken about the TCU project. Now what's happened is, quite frankly, there's been just so much going on with development, I've just never had time to actually sit down and write a video. And it got really annoying when I had so much stuff to do, or so much stuff to talk about, but I'd end up writing a really long script for a 50 minute long video and then I'd just never get around to editing it, or I'd get halfway through editing it and want to start again. You know the process, so this happened like six or seven times. So as it's a new year, I figured I'd try doing something different this time, and what we'll do is we'll do mini topics whereby I cover in some technical aspect a part of how the TCU works or like an algorithm that I've done for the TCU and why that's good and, you know, some of the more de development-based videos, which I know quite a few of you who watch the channel kind of like because you like the more technical side of my channel rather than just a it works and it's really nice kind of look at it. So I thought to start with, in this video we're going to look at how I've managed to accurately depict the clutch speeds of each gear change and also why that's kind of important for future topics I want to talk about. I do have a couple topics I want to talk about next, so stuff like pressure management, I've managed to simulate the whole valve body of the gearbox and, you know, um, accurate pressure simulations. And then also a whole video dedicated to torque converter and another video dedicated to configuration and setting things up. Not setting things up, but configuring the TCU on the fly without maps, if that makes sense. You'll see in the next video when I eventually release that. But I'm aiming to do these videos maybe about once a month or once every two months at most. I'm just so busy doing development on the TCU side and code wise and you can see all my progress on github for both the configuration app and the firmware itself there's just so much going on there but yeah i figured we'll do a video like this and we'll see how this goes you guys can leave some feedback in the comments etc to see if you like it or if you want me to do a different approach next time but i'm willing to change things if you guys don't like it or whatever but we'll see how this goes so as i said in this video we're going to go over clutch change theory and algorithms for calculating the clutch speeds of a gearbox, so I hope you guys enjoy this. So, I think I'll start this video off by discussing what the problem is with our current system before I develop this system. So up until now, the TCU was monitoring the gear change by just looking at the ratio difference between, say for instance, drive 2 and drive 3, and it would plot, okay, we're halfway there, so we're halfway shifting between the two, or we're fully shifting between the two, or we haven't shifted yet. This is all good, but the problem is that that's not what you feel in the car, what you feel is the transfer of torque between two different clutches. And this, if I can plot this on the screen now, does not actually happen necessarily in line with where the midpoint of the ratio changes. Now monitoring the clutch speed also has some other unique advantages that we cannot do with just looking at the ratio during the gear change. For instance, we can see exactly when a clutch starts to bite, we can look as mentioned before, a torque transfer point, and then we can use that torque transfer point to ramp up and down torque requests in response to how the clutches are progressing on and off, and we can also use it for pressure ramping. We can also detect when the clutch is fully engaged, and we can also use the system to detect flares. And all of this can then be fed into an adaptation system, which I haven't yet started working on, but my plan is to eventually work on that. So looking at this table, this is all the clutches which change during different gear shifts. It is fairly simple, the 722.6 cannot jump gears, it has to shift sequentially between each gear. Now I can simplify this table by changing it into something called shift groups. So for instance, when a shift solenoid activates, this is what you would call a shift circuit. So it's a flip-flop circuit between two different states. And now we only have three different cases to monitor. Now as for input information, we need to know the output shaft speed of the gearbox. This is derived using the ABS wheel sensors along with a coded differential ratio on the TCU. We also need to know the input shaft speed, which is calculated by the TCU based on two speed sensors present in the valve body. The N2 speed sensor monitors the front carrier gear shaft speed and the N3 speed sensor monitors the front sun gear speed. Now this algorithm needs to output a few things. First of all, if the input shaft calculation is trusted or not, because we might have speed sensor failures for instance, then obviously we need to output the input shaft speed. We need to output the V2 clutch pack speed for all gear changes. Now this will be mentioned in the next video about pressure management as to why this is important. We also need to know the on clutch and off clutch speed obviously. Now some terms for what's about to come up. We will use Q to denote the output shaft speed, I to denote the calculated input shaft speed, N2 and N3 to represent the speed sensors, N2 and N3, raw speed. We will use AN to represent the ring gear teeth of planetary set N, so we're going to label these planetary gear sets 1, 2 and 3, where 1 is at the front of the gearbox and 3 is at the rear of the gearbox. 
we only have three sets on the 722.6. We'll use BN to represent the sun gear teeth of planetary set N, C to represent the planetary gear teeth of planetary set N, we'll use R to represent the rotational speed of planetary set N, S to represent the sun gear rotational speed of planetary set N, and P to represent the planetary gear rotational speed of planetary set N. Now, I did lose my sanity quite a bit when developing all of these calculations that you'll come up and see, but in essence, here is all the equations for each drive ratio. If you fancy, go ahead and try calculating these yourself. Anyway, now for the important bit, how to calculate the clutch speed during the shift. Let's start off by looking at a simple one, which is the gear 1 to 2 and 2 to 1 transition. At the top here, we have the state of the gearbox in 1, and at the bottom, we have the state of the gearbox in 2nd. Any clutch or line here or gear here, which is in red, represents it is stationary and not moving. And at the bottom left, you can see the input shaft coming in, and on the mid bottom right, you will see the output shaft. So this is how the gear sets are arranged in the gearbox and how power flows. And these are the diagrams I'll be using for this. To calculate B1, since we know that B1 connects directly to the sun gear of the front set, and we know the N3 speed sensor monitors this directly, we can just say the speed of B1 is equal to the N3 speed sensor. Now, since K1 is connecting B1 to the front carrier set, we can actually say that its rotational speed is equivalent to N2 minus N3, because when these two values report the same number, it implies the whole front planetary set is locked in place. So K1 must be engaged. Also, B2 remains 0 RPM throughout this change because it's always locked. Now let's look at a harder one, which is the gear 2 to 3 and 3 to 2 to gear change. To calculate K2, since we know one side of it is connected to the input shaft of the gearbox, and the other side is connected to the carrier set or ring gear of the third or second planetary gear set, depending on which one you're looking at, we can say that the speed of K2 is the equivalent of the difference of these two speeds. Therefore, we can say K2 is the equivalent to the input shaft speed minus drive free ratio times the output shaft speed. To calculate K3, speed is a lot harder. We have to essentially do the calculation with K2 in reverse and then divide it by the difference in ratios between 2 and 3. And this is because K3 is holding an additional sun gear at the back of the gearbox in place and we have to account for this. But again, during this gear change, B2 will remain at 0. So we just can calculate that statically. Next, for the 3 to 4 and 4 to 3 gear change, we'll calculate B2 exactly the same way we did with K3, except we substitute different ratios into this equation, and this time we use drive free and drive through. K3 here acts very similarly to how 1 to 2 and 2 to 1 does for K1, so therefore we can just calculate its speed as the input shaft speed minus the speed of B2. Finally, we have the 4 to 5 and 5 to 4 gear change. This is exactly the same as 1 to 2 and 2 to 1, except we have to additionally calculate B2 which is done using the same equation we did to calculate it for 3 to 4 and 4 to 3. Now, how is this all used in the code base? Well, first of all, to calculate the input shaft speed, we have this lovely piece of code here, nice short function, nice and easy to understand. We first of all consult our moving average buffers, which are accumulated via interrupts for the N2 and N3 speed sensor, and we divide this number by two for each sensor, since we're currently detecting both the high and low edge of each pulse from the speed sensors, and we only want to account for one edge of it, so we divide this number by two. Then we calculate the input shaft speed based on these two previous numbers. Ratio two underscore one, noted here, is actually just ratio two divided by ratio one. Then, finally, we do a sanity check. So in gears two, three, and four, N2 and N3, as you saw in the previous diagrams, the whole front planetary carrier set should be locked, so N2 and N3 should be reporting the same number. Therefore, if we see a difference of more than 100 RPM between the two sensors, then we raise a flag to say that the input shaft speed can no longer be trusted. But again, this only happens if the gearbox is statically in 2, 3, or 4. Now, to calculate the clutch speed, I first of all wrote this little helper function, which deals with the two really long equations to calculate K3 and B2 speed. So here we have the numeration being calculated, and here we calculate the denominator and return the final value. And this is a great little function because we can just substitute the different gear ratios in and it will give us two different numbers. I'm also using this to calculate when B3 is applied, which will happen in reverse, but for now that's not important. We only care about forward shifts. Next, we have this whole function here, which actually does the bulk of the work for calculating the clutch speeds during the shift. So we first of all have to look at which change we are currently performing on the gearbox. So we have, for instance, a case for 1 to 2, 2 to 1, 5 to 4, 4 to 5 a case for 2 to 3 and 3 to 2, and a case for 3 to 4 and 4 to 3. Then we simply just set the clutch speeds. Based on the maths that you saw above, it's pretty easy to do this in code. And then finally, I wrote this function here, which essentially reports all of the speeds of every clutch during the gear changes. 
and this is only used for diagnostics in the config app since this function is extremely heavy to actually run. So it's only run intermittently in the config app for plotting. The TCU does not actually use this function. So how is this all used on the TCU? Well, currently there's still a bit to do with adaptation, but I can show you a little bit here and there. So to start with, within the pre-fill phase of the gearbox shift code, so this is when we are trying to fill the drums of the applying clutch. So here we can see if the clutch speed now of the off clutch, which should be released, is more than 25 RPM, then we detect and we raise a flag to say that the shift has started early. This way, the rest of the pre-fill phase is skipped and the gearbox moves straight to the overlap phase. And also, eventually, this will set a flag in the adaptation manager to say maybe to reduce the pressure next time it does this shift for the pre-fill phase, since it's taking less pressure to actually fill the drum up. Now, for pressure ramping in the overlap phase, we actually do a linear interpolation here between the clutch speed of the applied clutch and the pressure ramp for the target torque. And this way, we do this nice ease out as the clutch is being applied to dampen the final shock of the shift. We also have this block of code here, which signals to the torque converter that it should start pre-filling to lock up again once the off clutch speed has gone past the on clutch speed, i.e. torque transfer is complete, the shift will be ending very soon. And finally, the torque requests. Here we have this lovely block of code which deals with torque requests. So the on ramp, i.e. decrease in torque, is done statically, but then the ramp increasing torque back up again is done based on clutch speeds. So this way it is in line with the torque transfer of the gearbox, which is really, really nice and it gives a nice feeling as it's everything is in sync with each other. If you were to do this just based on time, not looking at the clutch speeds, you might get a situation where the torque suddenly comes on, but the gearbox hasn't actually finished shifting yet. So this way it's a really nice feel for the user. And with that, I think it's enough of me explaining things. I think we should just go for a drive and I can show you how the gearbox is performing with this and what this all looks like being plotted in real time. Okay, so what I've done is I've currently got my laptop recording the configuration app so that you guys don't have to watch it on here since there's too much glare whilst I'm driving. So I guess we'll just drive. I'm going to cut to when I'm on the road and then we can just see live what the car is doing and I can show you kind of why I've done this. So currently I'm in gear one and we're currently, well I've just shifted to gear one and I'm using the comfort profile with manual shifting which I have set to profile winter for now. So we'll just see how this looks on the charts. So it should be shifting fairly slowly. Let's see. So one, shift to two. Okay, and you can see the clutch transitions there and then two to three. Same again, you see the clutch transitions. you can see like also whilst it's changing gear like there's a nice smooth ramp as the clutch speed starts descending and a smooth ramp as it finishes so this is what helps to denote comfort is when it's having these nice like um, interpolated curves as it's rather than just a straight jagged drop in rpm because that you feel quite heavily in the in the car because there's no vibration dampening when it's doing that um, but currently it does do that if I put it in race mode. So I think once the oil temperature's warmed up a little bit, I will show what that's like. Listronics thinks I'm gonna crash into something. There's nothing there. currently see on my cluster there is a check engine light this is because last week the car went swimming in a giant puddle and it's broken one of the O2 sensors at the back or after the cat so I need to change that at some point but it's got nothing to do with the TCU I've scanned it already so again really nice two to three change there it's like really smooth because also one thing that I've done and I'll talk about this in another video is we've opened up the torque converter and needs to change to help with dampening of shock forces when changing gear like this is again something else that I've figured out that the stock TCU does change to manual so this is going to be like slightly tighter shifts or faster shift speeds but still quite comfortable and quite nice Like there's a 
little bit of a dip sometimes just before the car changes gear on the RPM charts. This is purely the torque request happening just a tiny bit too early so the input shaft speed drops a tiny bit. But this is why we have a threshold of about 25 RPM before it detects the shift has actually begun rather than so that like small drops in RPM like 5 or 10 don't trigger that detection. So now we're in first. Very nice shift. Two to three. Three to four. And now this road will open up to a 60 mile an hour one. So what I'll do is I'll put it in race mode. So then maybe you guys can hear what the car sounds like or shift speed wise. And you'll also see on the line graphs for the RPM that it's going to become very, very harsh when it starts changing. You can see that on there visually. So if I go 4 to 3 now in race mode, there you go. It's like an instant vertical line up as the plus speed increases, like it's instantaneous. Okay, and here's a 60 mile an hour gate, so I will go down to second gear. Again, it's quite harsh. But... Like, it is very, very harsh, and they, like I don't recommend running race mode all the time as well, because like, I've noticed since running it in race mode quite a lot that the back subframe of the car has taken quite a bit of a toll because the differentials like um, being moved quite harshly by the output shaft and also all the bushings around there don't like it. But at lighter throttle race mode is actually really nice. It's just if you put your foot all the way down it becomes really, really harsh. That's how the TCU detects a flare. Because it's almost like it's an invalid state in the equations that we've made. So if it goes into that zone, it will show up as a negative number, and then the TCU instantly knows, oh, that was a flare because the clutch speed came the clutch came off before it was meant to be applied. So now that we've finished driving, just to wrap up this video, I'm very happy with how this has gone. Uh, this particular algorithm and like the development of it. Yes, I've lost my sanity quite a bit trying to develop this, but Hey ho, it's worth it. There's so many research papers read and whatnot, and I've got so much more to talk about. But I think these bite sized videos where I go over one topic per video is a lot better for um, my own sake because trying to put it all into one video it just goes on forever, and I don't like it. So, yeah, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you have any more questions, then feel free to ask in the comments section. And as usual, I'm always reachable on my social medias and whatnot. But also, next video we'll be talking about pressure management and how I've managed to simulate the entire valve body of this gearbox because that was a big one as well and I think that's going to be a much longer video than this. So, I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye!